Uh, good morning again and welcome to Harvest Ministries. And we are excited that you're here as we kick off a brand new series entitled Tongue Pierced. Tongue Pierced. And uh, we are excited about this new series and we're going to be focusing today on the power of our words. And I think that most of you would agree with me that words have power. And in fact, Words are so powerful that sociologists have done some studies and they have developed what they call power phrases. Now these aren't in your notes, but if you have your outline, go ahead and get it out. And we encourage you to follow along each week and write things down. And uh, there's some space maybe there on your bulletin somewhere where you can write these power phrases down. So uh, just begin to follow along with these things. I want to give you uh, the four three, two, and one most powerful words in all of the English language. I want to give those to you this morning. The four most powerful words, according to the sociologists in the English language, are this, once upon a time. How many of you have ever heard that before? Probably in every childhood book you ever read, every fairy tale story, once upon a time was a very powerful phrase, and that's determined to be the most powerful four words in the English language. How about the second? Now, you kind of helped me out with this one. It begins with I. It ends with you. It's the three most powerful words. What would it might be? I love you. Those are the three most powerful words in the English language. How about the two most powerful words in the English language? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The two most powerful words in the entire English language. And the single most powerful word in the entire English language is the simple word I. It is the word I. And it's something about being existent and being in the right place in the right time. And it's something about that word I. So those are what sociologists say are the one, two, three, and four most powerful words in the entire English language. Words are very powerful. Words can either build up or they can tear down. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In fact, we're laying a foundation for this entire Tongue Pierce series this morning. Did you know that there are over 400 verses in the Bible that deal with our words? Over 400 verses in the Bible. Everything from how to use your words to the power of your words to where words come from and how to control your tongue. And we're going to look at many of those verses over the next several weeks, not all 400 of them, but we'll look at many of those 400 verses over the next several weeks as we get into this series. So let's begin by looking at our key verse for this entire series found in Proverbs 18, verse 21. And would you read this out loud with me this morning? The tongue has the power of life and death. Can we read it again like we mean it? The tongue has the power of life and death. That verse just simply means the tongue literally has the power to give life, to increase life, to add value to life, but it also has the power of death contained in it. And that word death in that verse is a Hebrew word that simply means to destroy or to tear down. So it can give value, it can add value, it can, it can increase life, it can give life, but it can also tear down and destroy. And I wonder this morning, how many of you agree with that verse? The tongue has the power to give life, and it has the power to give death. There are, there's something uh, about the language that we speak, and I want you to think of some of the words that you can use to tear down people. Maybe it's a word of criticism or a word of hate or a word of gossip. Those are all words that tear people down. It belittles people. It makes people feel small and makes them feel bad about themselves. And now think of some words that begin to give life to people, words of encouragement, words of comfort, and words of celebration. Words are powerful. And so I want you to think about today how you're using your words and the goal of this series is that you would become more conscious and I would become more conscious of the words we use every day and make an effort as much as possible every day in our language to use those words to bring praise and glory and honor to God because our words are powerful. In Matthew 22, 
Jesus tells us what the greatest commandments are. He said there are only two great commandments. The first is this, to love your Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Basically, love God with everything you are. Love him with everything. And then he said the second is like this, to love your neighbor exactly how you love yourself. Those are the two great commandments. So in this series, we want to learn how to use our words to love God but also to love others with our words. What would it look like if every word that came out of your mouth were a word that brought glory to God? What would that look like in your life? How would your life be different? What would it look like if everybody in your place of employment used words that showed love toward other people or built them up? How would that change your workplace? Everybody just walked around speaking words of love and of hope and of encouragement and building people. How would that change the the image of your workplace? What would it look like if within your family that every family member used words that build other family members up? How would it look like if in this church and every other church, if the people within that church used words that brought life instead of death? How would that change the complexion of our church, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. I wanna start by giving you three truths this morning about our words. Here's truth number one. Words are a gift from God. Words are a gift from God. Our ability to communicate and our ability to speak is a gift from God. In fact, the first words ever spoken were spoken by God in Genesis chapter one, in which God spoke the world into existence. God's words are powerful, and they can create destiny. God speaks a creative word in everything that he does. Words are powerful, and they are a gift from God. And so as human beings, we are God's primary creation. He created us in his image. Nothing else is created in the image of God except us. And as his primary creation, he gave us the ability to speak. Only we have the ability to speak this language that's human beings. Now, as much as you love your dog and your cat, and you think they're saying something to you, they do not have the ability to speak the language like we have the ability to speak the language. Only God gave that to us as human beings. Here's the second truth. Words can build up or they can tear down. Now we've already touched on this a little bit, but we probably all remember some words from our past that built us up. Somebody encouraged us, they loved us, they, they, they helped us along the way and they built us up with their words. But we can also remember some words of criticism in our life that tore us down. And I want you to try to finish this little sentence with me when I give you a clue, okay? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but Okay, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. If you are past the third grade this morning, you probably know that is a lie, right? That's just not true. Words hurt. In fact, words will hurt more and will have a lasting effect on your life more than if somebody threw a stick at you or a stone at you. Those words will stay there and the pain will be there throughout your lifetime. And so we know it's just not true. In fact, I could probably ask you to go back in your memory bank and remember the last time somebody criticized you or was harsh with you and you probably wouldn't have any trouble going back to that moment in your life and remembering what that person said to you. Could have been your spouse this morning. Could have been your boss last week. Could have been your mom or dad sometime this month. Could have been somebody that you work with. But your mind can go right back to those moments when someone was harsh or critical or they ran us down. Why? Because words really do hurt. They really do hurt. Here's the third truth this morning. The quality of my life is determined by the quality of my words. I like that. The quality of my life is determined by the quality of my words, and that's what this entire series is built upon. And maybe you've never thought about it this way before, but how you communicate and your ability to communicate, both your words in your mind as well as the words you speak, is going to affect the quality of your life. Whatever's in your mind 
And whatever you speak out of your mouth is going to affect the quality of your life. And you would probably agree with me that quality words can improve a relationship and negative words can tear down a relationship. So the quality of my relationships are determined by the quality of my words. And guess what? That is true in the spiritual life as well. Your ability to communicate with God, we call that prayer. Our ability to pray to God can either grow our spiritual life or it can diminish our spiritual life because of a lack of prayer or a lack of communication. And so the quality of my life is determined by the quality of my words. In fact, they did a study several years ago on violent prisoners. And they wanted to see what made these men and women so violent and made them the way they were. And here's what the researchers discovered as they looked at the vocabulary of some of the most violent prisoners in American prisons. They discovered that their vocabulary was about one-fifth of the average American. Now think about that. Quality of my words determines the quality of my life. Their vocabulary was about one-fifth of the average American. And researchers concluded this about those violent prisoners. They have no other way of expressing how they feel. And the only way they can express how they feel is by acting out in violence in some way. And so that is a clear example of how our ability to use words, or in this case, the inability to use words, can can correctly damage our quality of life. It can damage it, the words that we use. And so words are a gift from God. They can build up and they can tear down. And since the quality of my life is determined by the quality of my words, the question now becomes how can we harness the power of our words. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about this morning. How do we use our words every day to build up and to love people and to love God and to glorify God? I'm going to give you five ways to do it this morning. Here's the first way. Practice starting my day with praise. Here's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to practice starting my day with praise. Now, how do you start your day? What is your morning routine like. Now, whether you know it or not, we all have a morning routine, and we all do the same thing pretty much the same way all the time throughout our morning routine. And our routine seems like a very small part of our day, but in reality, our routine affects the entire rest of our day. And if one thing is out of balance, one thing doesn't go exactly right, if it doesn't happen like it always happens, it tends to throw your life out of balance. Now, I don't want you to get a visual in your head this morning, but when I get dressed every day, I have a routine that I go through. There are certain things I do in certain orders. I brush my teeth first, and I floss my teeth, and I rinse with mouthwash. Then I spray some spray up my nose to help me with my allergy attacks. Then I shave. And then I get into the shower. Now, that's where the visual stops, okay? Now, if any one of those things gets out of order, it kind of messes me up because I know in my life I never shave before I brush my teeth. I just don't do it that way. And it's my routine. And all of us have a routine that we go through every day of our lives. And it's pretty much the same routine. And you get stuck in that. If you start your day in a negative way, you may end your day in a negative way. But if you start your day in a positive way, you will probably end your day in a positive way. So what's your routine like this morning? What are the first words that come out of your mouth when you wake up in the morning? Some of you roll out of bed, you're wide awake, everything's just like it ought to be, you're chipper, ready to tackle the day, you know the old saying, and you roll out of bed and say, good morning, Lord. And then there's the rest of us who aren't like you, who are not chipper in the mornings, who don't necessarily care to get up at the crack of dawn, who kind of dread getting out of bed that day. We can say something like this. Good Lord, it's morning. You ever felt that way? And we got two extremes. We both fall in one of those categories. We either love it or we hate it. So here's my challenge for you this morning. For the next 21 days, now they say it takes 21 days for a habit 
or to create a habit in your life. So for the next 21 days, I want you to make praise a part of your morning routine. Now, what is praise? Praise is simply thanking God for who he is. That's what praise is. It's thanking God for who he is. It's thinking about God's attributes. God is loving. God is patient. God is forgiving. God is gracious. And it's just thanking God for all those things that he is. Praise is not thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is thanking God for what he's done for you. And there's a time for that. But I want to challenge you to start your day with praise and thank God for who he is in your life. And if you want to bring your life under God's control, you've got to start it with praise. Look at Psalm 145 and 2. I will praise you every day, not just on Sundays, not just at Bible study, not just when I'm in a church meeting. No, God, I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. You should circle those two words every day. But then look at the next phrase. I will praise you forever. Listen. You may get up late one morning, and you may miss your coffee. You may get up late, and you may not have time to eat breakfast. You may get up late, and you may not do something that's part of your morning routine. But I don't care how late you are. I don't care what's going on that day. Don't miss your morning praise. I got to get my praise on. I didn't have my cup of joe today, but I got to get my praise on. I didn't get to eat my eggs and toast this morning, but I've got to get my praise going. I didn't have time to put the trash out for the trash man, but that's okay. I've got to get my praise on. And if we can get in that mindset, God, every day I will praise you. It's more important, God, that I praise you than I do have that cup of coffee. It's more important, God, that I praise you than I do cut the news on and watch the news. God, I've got to praise you every day of my life. So I challenge you for the next 21 days, start your day with praise in your life. Here's the second thing. Offer words of encouragement to others daily. Offer those words of encouragement to other people daily. There is power in encouragement. So we need to use our words to encourage other people. Every human being wants to be encouraged. No matter who they are, no matter where they're at in life. Because everyone needs encouragement. In fact, as a Christian, you should look at people as though they have an invisible sign on them that says, encourage me. You should just see that on people all the time. Encourage me. And you should use your words to encourage people. And listen, when you encourage other people, you are encouraging yourself as well. It's kind of like the old theory. The more you give, the more it comes back to you. And the more you encourage, the more encouragement comes back onto you and into your life. Are you using your words for encouragement today? Listen, words of encouragement can last a lifetime. When you're down, when you're low, when you're lonely, when you're hurting, those words can last for a lifetime. And I probably imagine if you thought long enough and hard enough about it, you could remember somebody, a teacher, a coach, maybe somebody that you work for or a friend or a family member who at some time in your life spoke a word of encouragement into you. And that word was so powerful that it has stuck with you throughout all these years. Words are powerful. In fact, the Bible says this. So speak encouraging words to one another. We should be speaking these things to one another. I, I know it's hard when, when life is tough and things are going bad. I know it's hard to always speak an encouraging word. But the Bible tells us to think about what we're saying and speak encouraging words into each other's lives. Lots of ways to encourage people. You could give them a compliment. You could say a kind word. You can offer to help them. But speak those words of encouragement into people's lives. Now, this next point may seem a little strange to talk about in church. But we're going to talk about it. I'm going to work to remove all curse words from my speech. Oh! <gasps> Did he just really say that in church? There's people that go to church that curse. Well, sure, there's people that go to church that curse. And some people struggle with this point in their life. And that's why we're going to talk about this. I'm not trying to be legalistic. 
In fact, if you've been around Harvest Ministries for any length of time, you know that we're not a legalistic church. We try really hard to be a church that is full of the grace of God. But we also know this point. We are a church made up of imperfect people who serve a perfect God. And some of you grew up in an environment where your parents made cursing an art form. They were really good at it. And you don't have to raise your hand or acknowledge, but they were really good at it. And whether you know it or not, or believe it or not, that impacts your life. Now, I can honestly say this. I never, growing up in my entire lifetime, ever heard my mother or my father ever say a curse word. I never heard them one time say a curse word. But some of you didn't grow up like I grew up. You grew up in a different environment. You grew up in a different belief structure. And so you maybe still struggle with this even today as you're trying to serve the Lord. But one of the characteristics of people who are walking close to Jesus is they use pure speech. It's one of those characteristics. In fact, we could say it this way, your speech is a sign that you're walking close to God. That's what your speech is. Now, I'm not saying if you curse that God loves you or doesn't love you as much as he loves somebody else. I'm just saying your speech is a sign that you're walking close to God. Because the longer you're around somebody, the more you begin to pick up their dialect. You know? Some of you came from the north, northeast, and you moved down here to the south, and now you say things like southerners say things. And some of you or Southerners, and you've lived in the Northeast, and you begin to pick up some of that Northeastern dialect in your, in your speech and, and the way you said things. When you walk with God, you can't help but pick up and begin to sound like God sounds. Our speech reveals that we've been walking close to God. In fact, there's a fascinating story about a revival that broke out in America in 1904. It happened in a particular coal mining town, and the miners were being saved left and right, as we would say. And I want you to listen to what someone wrote about this revival that broke out in this coal mining town. They said stoppages occurred in the coal mines as a result of this revival, not due to the unpleasantness between management and workers, but because so many foul-mouthed miners became converted, and stopped using foul language. And here's where it gets really good. They stopped using foul language so much that the horses that hauled the coal trucks into the mines could no longer understand what was being said to them. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the horses are being cursed at so much that when the miners stopped cursing, they didn't know what to do. What had happened? There had been a change in their life and in their speech as a result of that change. It goes to the point that the absence of cursing is a sign that God is working in our life. Now look at James chapter 3. James said the tongue is restless and evil. It is full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and our Father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. And James simply says, this is not right. Cursing is like taking a small poison each day. It probably won't kill you, but it's not going to help you either. And that's, that's really what it's like. And if you struggle with this, I want to encourage you to work on this during this series. And you may not be ready for this, but in two weeks, two weeks from today, we're going to do a sermon on the art of cursing. And I hope you'll be here to hear that sermon and hear what the Word of God has to say about our words and how blessings and cursings both come out of our mouths. So I hope you'll come and be here. And I would venture to guess I've been in church for 47 years now that I have never heard an entire sermon preached on the art of cursing. And I bet most of you have never heard one preached on it either. But you will in two weeks if you're here. Here's number four. Exercise listening twice as much as I speak. Part of this tongue pierced lifestyle that we're going to be talking about is not only knowing what to say and when to say it, but it's also knowing when to say nothing at all. Just remain silent and listen. 
fact, someone has rightly observed that God gave us two ears and one mouth because he wants us to listen twice as much as we speak. Mark Twain said it this way, it is better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you are a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. <laughs> Arthur Sally Barger said it this way, you never saw a fish on the wall with its mouth shut. You have to think about that one for a minute. And I'm not sure who said this one, but I like it. A small mind and a big mouth are usually found in the same place. That's a good one. Somebody ought to write that down. Here's what the writer of Proverbs said. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Which would you rather be this morning? you want to be a fool or do you want to be a wise person? And I understand it's hard sometimes when you have been raised in an environment and you've lived your entire life thinking you know all the answers, thinking you know how to do everything, thinking your way is the only way, your way is the only right way to do it. And it's hard to close your mouth and listen to what people are saying. But God wants us to listen to what people are saying more than he wants us to ex express our thoughts and our opinions about everything. And if we will listen to people, we can learn from people. And if they will listen to us, they can learn from us. So I want to challenge you over the next several weeks to exercise listening. Exercise it. And it takes practice to exercise listening when you're used to doing all the talking. Here's the last thing I want to talk about this morning as we harness the power of our words. I'm going to release my whole life to God. I'm going to release my whole life to God. This really is a central issue for the tongue pierce lifestyle. Are you willing to release your whole life to God? See, the Bible says that there is a connection between what we say and the status of our heart. If we have an impure heart, we will speak impure words. If we have a heart full of praise, we will speak words of encouragement. If we speak, have a heart full of cursing, then we will speak curses. If we have a f heart full of blessing, then we are going to speak blessing on others. There is a direct correlation between what's in my heart and what comes out of my mouth. And it goes to the very central teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 15. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. That word, the heart, that phrase, the heart, in the scripture from the Greek simply means the center of your being. That's what defiles you. What is at the very core of who you are? If it is blessing, you'll speak blessing. If it is cursing, you'll speak cursing. Whatever it is, whatever's at the core of who you are, that's what defiles you, and that is what will come out. You see, we may learn words and we may understand and, uh, those, what they mean from people around us, but words don't come from somebody else. They don't come just from society. Those words, the Bible say, come ultimately from our heart. And it is an indicator of where our heart really is. Probably the best way to explain it is think of your heart, your inner being, as it has a driver's seat on it. And most people spend their entire life in competition with who is going to sit in the driver's seat of their heart. Who's going to be in control? Will I be in control or will I let somebody else be in control? And when we become believers in Jesus Christ, we get out of the driver's seat and we say, Jesus, now you are in the driver's seat of my life. You are in control. But before that, we're going our own way, and we're just going down into a life of sin. In fact, we're going down a wrong road because we're in the driver's seat. But when we come to Christ, we surrender our lives to him, and we get out of the driver's seat, and we let him take control of our lives. And I dare say most of us here today have done that. We've gotten out of the driver's seat and said, God, you take control of my life now. You are in control. I'll go down whichever road you want me to go down. If you haven't done that today, maybe you'll make that decision to get out of the driver's seat and let him move into that position in your life. But even when we've done that, even when we've gotten out of the driver's seat and said, God, you get in the driver's seat of my life, every now and then, there's a struggle inside of us of who is really going to be in control of our lives. And every now and then, we'll walk up to that driver's seat and we'll just kind of look at what God's doing in our lives. And then if we're not careful, we'll try to share control of our lives with him. Maybe help God out a little bit. 
And then there are times, if we be honest, we could say we've actually sat on the edge of that seat with God in our lives and kind of nudged him over a little bit and say, okay, God, let me help you with this because I know how I want my life to go and I know where I want it to go. Let me help you take control of my life. And sadly, sometimes we push him out of the way altogether. Are you trying to share your driver's seat of your heart with the Lord this morning? Or have you given him full control of your life? Is there some area that you're trying to control and trying to maintain control over? Or have you said, God, I'm giving you my whole life this morning? That's what he wants us to do. In fact, Romans 6, 13 says this, our last verse for today. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument to serve of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body. Your whole body includes your tongue. That's what we're talking about. So we can say, so use your tongue as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. That's what this entire series, Tongue Pierce, is all about. It is using our tongue to do what is right as an instrument to bring glory and praise and honor to God, our Heavenly Father. That's what it's all about. And here's what I want you to do this morning. If you took notes and you're one of my note takers, I want you to look back over those five points I gave you today. I want you to look at those five ways that you can harness the power of your words. And I want you to ask God where you're seated at right now, God, which one of these do I need to work on the most this week? Which thing is it, God? I don't want you to tackle all five of them at one time because that'd be impossible. But you can tackle at least one of these things this week and say, God, which one thing do I need to tackle this week? going to start your day off by praising God every day? You're going to offer words of encouragement to people you come in contact with? You're going to work at removing all those curse words out of your speech? Maybe you're going to work at practicing the art of listening twice as much as you speak? Or are you going to release your whole life to God? God, which one of these things do I need the most work on this week in my life and just circle that point in your notes there this morning just put a big circle put an x a star by it, whatever you do this is what i've got to work on this week in my life god i've got to praise you each day or i need to offer words of encouragement or i need to remove these curse words from my speech or i need to listen more than i speak or god i need to release my life back to you which is it going to be As you're circling that, let me tell you, next week we're going to talk about the art of confrontation. How we handle ourselves in that situation and what words we say during that time and how it affects us. If you have that in your hand, what you circle, what God's placed on your heart, what God's brought to your mind this morning, what you need to work on today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me.